Welcome to Piano Keys Academy. I'm Dr. Finley, coming at you today with the second installment of my Arm Impulse series. This week's topic is a bit of a doozy. It is single and double rotations as taught in the Taubman approach. I'm including these in the discussion of arm impulses because they share a common goal with downward and forward arm impulses in that they are a strategy for coordinating the movements of your fingers with the structures behind them. Properly applied, the tools of the Taubman approach can help you learn to analyze a score from a technical standpoint, almost like a harmonic analysis. It teaches you to balance on each finger, which takes the effort out of playing, and it gives you a powerful tool to navigate the twists and turns of complex passage work. I'm not going to lie, this is a very complicated topic and there's no easy way to summarize this information in a short amount of time. So I'm going to try not to get into the weeds today. All I'm going to do today with this video is to introduce those of you who are unfamiliar to the existence of the Talman approach, explain single and double rotations at a very surface level, and point you towards the appropriate resources should you wish to explore the approach on your own. Speaking of which, for more detail than I'm able to get into within the scope of this video, please check out the links in the description. Now before I get myself into too much trouble, I must stress that I am not a certified Taubman teacher, and this will not be a Taubman focused channel. Please take everything I say and demonstrate with this in mind. I became interested in the approach about 10 years ago and briefly trained with a Taubman teacher for a period of about three months. I also wrote my dissertation on the subject, so I've been fairly well exposed to the principles involved, but if you're looking for something more authoritative, please consult an experienced Taubman teacher. For more information on where to find one, once again, please check out the links in the description. Now that that lengthy disclaimer is out of the way, let's get started. As I said in my last video, a key principle underlying any healthy approach to piano technique is that the fingers shouldn't act alone, but as part of a coordinated system. They are the endpoint of a kinetic chain. The Taubman approach places special emphasis on the last three links of the chain, namely the forearm, hand, and finger. These are to function as a unit, and the first thing a student is taught is to find the natural resting position of the finger, hand, and forearm. Let's take a look at this skeleton together. Notice the shape of the fingers. The fingers are close together and they are slightly curved, but not artificially so. Likewise, they are not artificially straight. Ligaments hold the finger in this shape without our having to contract a single muscle. Now look at the wrist. It's neutral, neither flexed nor extended, and it's not twisted towards the pinky side or the thumb side. If you will indulge a silly analogy, I want you to imagine that these bones are hoses with water flowing through them. When the bones are arranged just so, the water would flow freely from the elbow to the fingertip into the key, but adjust the alignment at any point and there would be a diminution in the flow of water. An extreme enough break would cut off the flow altogether. This is how I like to think about funneling the gravity of the arm into the keyboard for maximum leverage. To find this ideal position for the finger hand and forearm, let your arms go completely limp and let them hang from your shoulders. If you do this properly, you'll notice how heavy your arm actually is. Shake out any excess tension. Now, I want you to notice the angle of each joint. Your wrist should be neutral and your fingers should be slightly curved, but not overly so, just like the skeleton. The main idea behind the Talbot approach is that the fingers, hand, and forearm function optimally when in this position. There are certain specific deviations from this position that you especially need to watch out for. Curling, stretching, and twisting chief among them. I'm planning a video in the near future about common injuries and their causes, so I won't go into detail here about why each of these habits can lead to injury, but just be aware that all three of these habits can and often do lead to repetitive stress injuries. Let's take this to the piano. The bench will need to be at a certain height in order to maintain this alignment of finger, hand, and forearm. With proper posture and the shoulders relaxed and down, the elbow should be at or slightly above key level. I prefer for the elbow to be slightly above key level. Returning to the hose analogy, when the elbow is slightly higher than the key, it facilitates the flow of water into the key. Now that I'm sitting properly and have found the natural alignment of the finger, hand, and forearm, I can practice balancing on each finger. When 
When a student is first trained in the Taubman approach, they are taught a sort of tossing motion. You send the finger, hand and forearm up, and you let gravity take you freely down. Careful not to break the alignment, especially at the wrist. So when you go up, don't go up like this, but make sure a hand and finger come with you. Careful also not to collapse in what Taubman called a relaxation movement. That would look like this. So you don't want the joints to collapse upon playing the key. Instead, once the note has been played, it's done. The movement is done. The bones are perfectly stacked so that they can comfortably sit on the finger that is playing. Perfectly balanced. The engine, so to speak, of the Taubman approach is forearm rotation, which is this movement here. A good way to isolate this movement is to put your arm in front of you, as I am doing. Turn your forearm towards yourself and then towards the floor. Turning towards yourself is called supination, and turning towards the floor is called pronation. Supination and pronation are the two components of forearm rotation. The reason rotation plays such an important role in this approach to piano playing is that it is a very agile movement of the forearm, and it's one that stands a chance of keeping up with the fingers. At the most basic level, single rotations are for changes of direction, and double rotations are for passages that continue in the same direction for more than two notes. You're probably already familiar with single rotations. This is what most people refer to when they talk about rotation. Single rotations are when you rock back and forth. And these are to handle changes of direction. So for example, broken thirds, broken octaves, or trills, tremolos, alberti bass, Chopin Black Keys Etude, or the um, Winter Wind Etude also. All of these are examples of single rotations. Anything that zigzags on the page or anything that requires a change of direction. Double rotations, on the other hand, look like this. After the initial two notes, which are actually a single rotation, which I will explain in a second, the other two notes continued in the same direction. In each case, I went to the right in order to play to the left. This is because in the Taubman approach, every playing motion is preceded by a preparatory rotational swing in the opposite direction, a little like the backswing of a golf club, or the movement you'd make to prepare to kick a soccer ball. That means the first note of any given passage is prepared. Let's see that five finger passage again. So I rotated to the left to play the first note to the right. And then the next note is played to the left. So that is just a simple single rotation. Prep right for five, left for four. Prep, right, left. Now to continue, I now have to go right to go left. I have to go right to go left. I have to go right to go left. So there was a preparatory swing, a single rotation, and then three double rotations. Prep, single, double, double, Here's what a scale looks like. Prep, single, double, single, single, double, double, double. Now, why was that a single rotation in the middle of that, even though the notes are continuing in the same direction? It's because I'm going from finger three to finger one. So the rotations are determined not by the direction of the passage, but the direction of the fingering. So three to one will always be a rotation towards the thumb. In fact, thumb crossings are one of the things that I find the Taubman approach especially effective for. And that's a topic for another day. I don't have time to get into that today. Timing is important. The purpose of the prep swing is just to prepare the finger to drop into place. So you shouldn't begin the prep until you are ready to play. So it's the playing motion that's important. You should never practice like this. 
You should play and stay. You prepare and play. You prepare and play. Play and stay. Play and stay. Play and stay. Otherwise, you're just cultivating instability. Think about it. What do you think this is going to look like when it's fast? So that's the opposite of the goal. You want to come cultivate stability, not instability. Eventually these rotations get minimized. Here's what that five finger scale might look like once you minimize the movement. I actually still felt the rotations that time, so even that is a little bit exaggerated. But what I really feel are the fingers dropping into place. Since in this system of playing there is no follow-through to speak of, or absorption, as there is in the Russian arm impulses that I talked about last time, or the forward impulses we'll discuss next time, you must make sure to control the speed of key descent in order to avoid having a harsh sound. It is all too easy to sound like this, instead of this. I hope the difference between those was apparent. It's not just a difference in volume. When you force to the bottom of the key, one of the things that tends to happen is the hammer kind of flattens against the string and kills some of your sound. It results in that sort of twang that you might associate with a pianist that plays with a bad sound. <laughs> um, so make sure that you're controlling, that you know where the point of sound is, which is the point at which the sound is made, about seven millimeters into key descent. And then that's where you're aiming. And not towards the bottom of the key. And just control the speed of key descent. If it goes down too quickly, you'll get that twangy sound. Rotation is only one part of a much larger vocabulary of movement. The other main categories of movement in the Taubman approach are in and out movements, like this to accommodate fingers of differing lengths and to navigate black and white keys. Something called the walking hand and arm. Which is something like an up, across, and down, up, across, and down, up, across, and down, lateral movement of the forearm to get across distances. And it also used to assist in chord playing and octaves and double notes, and shaping, which are curvilinear and up and down movements of the forearm that serve to bring all of these other movements together. So that, so something like that, that would be an example of an overshape that serves to minimize all the other movements that go into that passage. The promise of the Taubman approach is that just as you can do a harmonic analysis that shows you how to make sense of every note on the page, you can do a technical analysis that accounts for how to play every note on the page. I find it especially useful for getting around the piano laterally and for mapping out changes of direction. The Taubman approach also has a long and proven track record of helping pianists and other musicians recover from injuries, including tendonitis, nerve damage, and even vocal dystonia. A word of caution. With any approach to technique that especially focuses on movement, there is an unfortunate tendency to separate the choreography of the hands from the music itself. It is of course possible to engage the ear, control your sound, and play with sensitivity and power using the tools of the Taubman approach. And mechanical disconnected playing can happen no matter what your approach to playing the piano. So what I'm saying is not specific to Taubman at all. I'm just saying this because there is so much emphasis on how to move in this system of playing that it's all too easy to focus on those movements alone and to forget about the rest. My advice is beware of being too clinical. Always insist on good sound quality and never forget that any technique is a means to an end. What is important at the end of the day is your musical conception. Technique is merely the means to realize it. So last week we talked a lot about the shoulder and this week focused on forearm, hand, and finger. The lower body and trunk also have a part to play and a holistic approach to technique, and I will show you exactly how in the next video on forward arm impulses. Until then, happy practicing.